Uh, we're going to start this next panel, Healthcare Quality Essential for Achieving Health Equity. Um, and for me, it's wonderful because it's a panel of friends, colleagues, people I've known for a few years. I'll put it that way. And the moderator for this session is Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt, who is uh, Director of the Department of Health uh, in the Government of District of the Columbia. She's a board-certified family physician who became director in January 2015. She leads Mayor um, Browser's Health and Wellness Initiative and serves key leadership roles in addressing critical health care issues such as use of synthetic drugs, impact of medical marijuana, decriminalization of marijuana, as well as innovation in healthcare delivery and its impact on high cost, high need, and other populations. Importantly, uh, Laquandra is an alum of the fellowship program. And what I learned last summer, it was wonderful. So uh, last summer I had the privilege of doing the Cobb lecture for the NMA and got a challenge from the audience around Flint, Michigan. Um, and it was wonderful. And I was trying to figure out what am I going to say about Flint? Um, and then Laquandra stood up and said, I am from Flint. <laughs> and it changed the discussion. It's one part when people who aren't from a place talk about the place, and when the person from the place says, now, now what are you telling me? Because that's where I'm from. Um, and that's before a lot of these other things broke out about what was going on in Flint. But Flint, to me, is just one place of many with similar kinds of issues across our country. So I am so pleased that she's in the position that she's in in terms of her leadership in Washington, D.C., and her leadership um, that she's displayed ever since she's left the fellowship program. I turn it over now to Dr. Laquanda Nesbitt. Thank you. So I recognize that we're at the close of the day uh, for this program uh, today that will continue for tomorrow, and we hope that many of you will join us uh, for that day as well. But we are very excited about this panel, uh, in particular as the, the nomenclature or the language that we use about improving minority health has transitioned from health disparities uh, to health equity, and how people wrap their minds around this notion of health equity and really having a greater appreciation for the social determinants of health and the role that social determinants of health play in achieving health equity. And having a lot of discussions about working upstream and what it means to work upstream. And even in our discussions that we had this morning and the presentations that we listened to this morning, really m focused on having a better understanding or making sure that we understood that the social context and the environments in which patients and individuals live have a tremendous impact on their health outcomes. But we have to make sure that we don't miss what still needs to happen in healthcare in order for us to achieve health equity. And so that the panel that we have before us uh, for the next hour will have us really focus and understand what is the role of healthcare in terms of how we focus on healthcare quality and using healthcare quality in terms of it being an essential component of achieving health equity. So we have three panelists before us today who play different roles uh, in healthcare as it relates to healthcare quality to give us some insight into healthcare quality and its ability to help us achieve health equity. I'm going to introduce all three panelists uh, before we get into the presentations. They will move through their presentations sequentially and then we'll have the opportunity to have discussion uh, after the panelists. So we're making some adjustments to catch up for time here. Um, First, we're going to hear from Dr. Quinn Nometzger, uh, who is currently with the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, and she'll talk to us about better research and targeted screening, a path to health equity. Our second presenter will be Dr. Kara Odom Walker from PCORI, uh, who, who will give us more insight into PCORI's role in reducing disparities and raising the bar for quality of care and patient-centered outcomes. And lastly, we'll hear from Dr. Kara James, who's the Director of the Office of Minority Health in the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. So for the, to, in the essence of time, I'll save you from reading all of their biographies, which are included here in your packet. So we'll start with Dr. Quinn Nometzger. So good afternoon. I have the nice job of being the speaker right after lunch, and I know you're all a little sleepy and postprandial. So 
Um, my talk today is going to focus on why we need better research and targeted screening as pathways to health equity. So uh, in order to keep you awake, I'm going to start with a controversial topic, um, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force's breast cancer mammography screening recommendation as a case study. Um, you know, President Obama talked about having uh, the moonshot in order to cure cancer. I think what we need to do is talk about where we are today, that's the theme of this conference, where we are today and where we need to go. What I'd like to do is talk a little bit about the breast cancer screening recommendation of 2016, where we are today, the data that brought us here, but also where we need to go in the future in order to achieve health equity. So uh, in 2016, the task force put out a recommendation for mammography, and it uh, reviewed three systematic reviews on breast cancer, looking at harms and benefits, um, looking also at 3D mammography, and also looking at breast cancer screening for women with dense breast. It also looked at several analytic models, um, looking at harms and benefits, as well as the radiation-induced breast cancer. And I just want to start by saying that, that not all cancers are the same. So this picture is borrowed from the National Cancer Institute, and it, uh, on the y-axis is the tumor growth, and the x-axis is, is time. And if you think about cancers, different types of cancers as different animals trying to escape from a barnyard, there's some cancers that are like birds. They fly out. They appear, and they move very quickly, and it's very difficult to catch them. They metastasize before you can do anything about it. And many of these cancers, screening does not help because they are so aggressive and they spread so quickly. And then there are other cancers that are like rabbits. They are fast, but you could actually catch them in time by screening. And hopefully you can catch it before it, the symptoms begin and you can do something about it before death occurs. And then there are other cancers that are like the turtle that's moving, trying to get out of the barnyard, but it's moving very slowly and it's really not going anywhere. So keep this picture in mind as we go through the talk. So uh, how did the task force come up with its recommendation in 2016 for mammography screening? The first question it asked was, does mammography reduce deaths from breast cancer? And I think the answer is unequivocally yes. Benef uh, having mammography improves considerably when the woman is older, but it starts even when you're younger. So this is, uh, these are numbers for breast cancer deaths avoided per 10,000 women who are screened regularly. Um, regularly here means screening one to two to three years um, over a 10-year period. And uh, it's three deaths are avo avoided for women ages 40 to 49. Eight deaths are avoided for women 50 to 59. 21 deaths are avoided for women 60 to 69, and 13 deaths are avoided for women 70 to 74. So there's benefit all across the age range, um, although the benefits are higher in the age range of 60 and 69, and this is because cancer incidence is highest in this age group for women. Um, so cross-checking the randomized control trial evidence against observational studies, um, the relative risk reduction with screening for the randomized control trials are about 20%, whereas for the observational studies, it's about 25 to 30%, slightly higher. What are the potential harms of mammography? Now, it's not intuitively obvious to many people that screening actually does have potential risk, and preventive services both have potential benefits and potential harms. So the main harms of mammography screening are overdiagnosis and overtreatment. And this occurs mainly in the cancers that's like that turtle that's moving very slowly that does not manifest itself um, and may not harm a woman anyway during her lifetime. Other harms include false positive tests resulting in follow-up testing and invasive procedures, as well as false negative tests with missed cancers and false reassurance and very small, um, rarely radiation-induced breast cancers. So the most serious harm of mammography screening is overdiagnosis. And overdiagnosis is when the tumor 
it looks like a cancer, or looks like a malignancy, but it behaves differently in that it grows extremely slowly. It stagnates, it even regresses. Many of the DCIS, the stage zero cancers, are probably, some of them are in this, but some of them are more aggressive. It's hard to know which ones. So whenever we diagnose DCIS, we will treat it anyway because we don't know which ones will progress and which ones don't. Um, so what percentage cancers are detected in my, by mammography or overdiagnosed? It's still difficult to determine because we don't know this directly. Um, but it's estimated roughly about 20% or one in five women may be treated for cancers that would never have been discovered or have caused health problems because they grow too slowly. Um, and so here's some numbers on the false positives. Uh, these are the harms of mammography over 10,000 women screened once. And as you can see uh, on, on the left side for 40 to fo age 40, 49, there's more false positive tests in that age group. That's because the incidence of breast cancer is lower. And as you progress, there's less false positive as incidence of breast cancer is higher. So in summary, um, mammography does reduce death from breast cancer um, and it's definitely worth doing. However, one out of five women treated for breast cancer may be overdiagnosed and overtreated. Um, and false positive tests and invasive procedures are, are common, especially in younger women. Um, this is, slide kind of helps answer the questions, what's the optimal age to start screening? I don't think that's a, there's a real right answer to that, but at least this shows you what happens if you begin at age 40 to start screening versus 50 years. So this is, if you follow a cohort of 1,000 women and you follow them today until their death, um, 25 women, will die from breast cancer without any screening, 25 out of 1,000 women. If you start screening at age 50 to 74 every two years, you will reduce the number of deaths to 18 so that seven women can avoid a death from breast cancer. If you start at age 40 instead of age 50, you could potentially reduce the number of, of deaths to 17 so that one additional woman would avoid a breast cancer death. So the task force in 2016 recommends that mammography be done every two years for women ages 50 to 74. And for, pri for women younger than 50 years, um, starting screening should be an individualized shared decision making um, once the woman knows the harms and the benefits. So there's an increasing convergence about individualized decision making for women in their 40s. The American College of Physicians recommends screening mammography decisions um, be individualized for women 40 to 49. The American Academy of Family Physicians is similar to the task force. And then the American Cancer Society recommends screening starting at age 45 and individualized uh, decision making between 40 and 44. So why, why not make a separate recommendation for African-American women. That was a question that we get asked quite a bit. Um, and we know that African-American women are severely underrepresented in these randomized control trials that this data and this recommendation was based on because all these trials were done primarily in Europe and Canada in white women. So there was very little direct evidence in African-American women or any women of color um, in these trials. So the task force looked at eight randomized control trials, over 200 studies, reviewing eight, the 81 studies about effectiveness, and did all kinds of meta-analysis and modeling. But you need to go back to the original studies, and what, what we see is that the trials were all done in white women. Uh, most of them were done in Sweden, which is a pretty small, homogeneous country. The non-Swedish studies were done in, in New York and then some in Canada, and then there was the AIDS trial which was conducted in the UK, again primarily in white women. Um, as far as for non-experimental trials, I mean non-experimental non studies, again, these were done primarily in uh, white women in Canada, Sweden, Europe, and, and other places. So as I've said before, all cancers are not the same. And for African-American women, African-American women have higher incidence of cancer before age 40. There's higher cancer mortality rates in African-American women than any other racial ethnic groups. 
And the gap in mortality between African American women and white women is wider now than it was in the early 1990s. We're not sure what the reason is for this disparity. It could be biology, because African American women are more likely to develop triple negative phenotypes and other aggressive tumors. So they're more likely to have tumors that are like those birds that fly out quickly that are aggressive. But there may be, and most likely there are, socioeconomic um, issues as well regarding treatment delays and lack of health care services. So that's where we are today in 2016. There's very limited data on the benefits and harms of screening in African American women. All the data are in white women and white European or Canadian women. There's limited data on DCIS, limited data on triple negative cancers, as well as targeted screening for higher risk women such as African American women. We also need more research on access to care, access to screening, and access to treatment and, and looking at different treatment options as well as morbidity, mortality, and interventions to achieve health equity. So that's where we are today, and that's where we need to go. And I think this panel is all about where we need to go, because certainly I don't think that these recommendations are adequate, but they're evidence-based based on the evidence that we have in 2016. And my hope is that when we come back here 20 years from now, um, there will be much more evidence for African American women so that the task force can make recommendations that are more targeted um, and more individualized. And we're hoping that the precision medicine that President Obama talks about will, will be occurring in the next several years. So thank you. So we were talking about the need for more evidence. Um, and enter PCORI. So I'm going to have some slides in a second. Well, I'm just going to get started, and there will be some slides in a second. So my name is Kara Odom-Walker. I'm the Deputy Chief Science Officer at PCORI. Um, there we go. And I just I want to share a perspective about what PCORI's role is in providing greater evidence, as Quinn just talked about. We have been set up from the Affordable Care Act, and PCORI came into the author authorizing legislation because people were talking about how do we improve value in care and cost and quality. It came out of a debate, political debate, about death panels. Sarah Palin said, well, this new organization is going to all be about death panels and killing grandma. Well, you know, PCORI's really trying to figure out how to change that conversation in the healthcare sector today to make sure that we're talking about how we look at evidence in a different way that really incorporates patient perspectives, stakeholder perspectives, and we think about how we improve um, the evidence that we use from a comparative effectiveness paradigm. And so that's what PCORI is set out to do. We have about $500 million a year over the course of our lifetime. We'll commit about $2 billion towards um, a, a evidence body in clinical comparative effectiveness. And it provides physicians like you and I the opportunity to say, I don't have enough evidence to guide my patients. How do we get more evidence in areas and topics that are important to many stakeholders? So we're trying to look to find answers for real world questions that um, work best for patients and their providers based on their particular characteristics and concerns. Our work is really different from many other funding agencies in that we're trying to make sure that these are very pragmatic questions that are coming from stakeholders and patients, but also have an engaged paradigm. Much of the work that you have done is around how do you properly engage stakeholders so that they're decision makers in the research pathway. That is what PCORI embraces. It, we embrace it in the applications we receive, in the merit review process, and at the end of the day, when we start disseminating the research findings, we want stakeholders there with us, making sure that they're ready to put them into guidelines, to put them into practice in a much faster timeline. And we're working across stakeholder communities. So when you start thinking about how you improve research and how you improve 
quality of care for different populations. We have to think about what works for whom, and we need those voices at the table. And so this engagement paradigm will allow us to be more patient-centered, relevant, and useful. It's not just about saying disparities exist. It was called out in the legislation. It was built into how we fund and where our national priorities are. But it is about making sure we're working with those communities in an ongoing way to make sure that we're reflecting the outcomes that matter to those communities and also that we make sure that, that people are ready to use the evidence at the end of the day. And this is what we mean when we talk about engagement. We know that engagement does make a difference. There is limited evidence out there about what engagement in research means and what it does to provide a new lens on comparative effectiveness research. But this systematic review showed that there were 66 studies and patient and public involvement enhanced quality and the appropriateness of research. It's not just about culturally tailor tailoring that latest gadget or tool, but it's really about how is it making a difference and does it make an impact that makes sense. So we're continuing to work across stakeholder organizations. Many of you will end up being one of these stakeholders who has to voice the concerns of communities of color and make sure that the research and the policy decisions that are made based on that research make sense and are put into decisions that are important for all of the stakeholders involved. And so we think about this across the paradigm, but I will say that many of the stakeholders who are at the table for research tend to be the patients, they tend to be the clinicians. We still need to figure out ways to have a broader conversation with the private sector, with industry, with purchasers, and with other health systems. And so as you're doing your work, think about how we can bring that conversation full circle. We think about this cycle as a way to get to better questions. So if you're in a clinical situation, we want to think about how those questions get put into applications that can be funded and how those findings will be um, incorporated into guidelines. And then ultimately, we want PCORI to be able to take those findings and put them into high priority research areas and funding announcements. One example is, is we actually funded a large $30 million study to look at screening for uh, breast cancer. And we want to think about how these kinds of questions will make impacts in important populations. So please continue to think about PCORI when we're moving forward and when we're thinking about the next phase of PCORI's life cycle. Across the sector right now, we are funding in these five national priorities of research. This came from stakeholder-generated ideas. Some of it was indicated in the legislation, but most of it was just from talking to people about where we needed to go and where we need better evidence. I'll say to this group, probably any research question in disparities issues could go into any of these five national priority areas. And so we're, we're continuing to work with communities and um, applicants to think about how we embed disparities questions across the applications and across our large trials over time. To date, we've funded almost 500 projects and about half of the amount that was put into the authorizing legislation. We continue to look to, for ways to fill out this map over time. We also continue to have a focus in tracking priority populations of interest, because as Quinn mentioned, there are many studies that are out there and systematic reviews that have um, historically not incorporated some populations of interest. And so we're continuing to look at how we do this in a more systematic way, looking across racial and ethnic minorities, but also low income, low health literacy, rural areas, persons with disabilities. And this is just a short list. We have uh, um, much more uh, sophisticated tracking about veterans, elderly, women, pediatric populations as well. But we want to think about what is patient-centeredness. You know, everybody says, Where's Waldo? But not everybody says, well, Waldo? Poor Waldo looks so sad there. And, and that's what we mean by patient-centeredness. We're trying to figure out not just about the patient's hemoglobin A1C, but how are they feeling? Are they able to go to work and play with um, grandkids and family members in the way that they intend? That's what we mean when we want to say there are patient-centered outcomes embedded in all of our research questions. 
And we want this information to be compiled in a way that's accessible to the public. Part of PCORI's mission is to create lay summaries that are accessible and friendly to all populations, not just the researchers and not just us in the room who know statistics and all of the other uh, sophisticated techniques that we use. But we want to make sure that people can say, what are the options? Just lay them out for me in a way that makes sense. And this is just one way. They're washers if you can't see them from the back. And, and this is just one way that we want to think about it. So CER was established so that we can think about the appropriate um, decisions that are real decisional dilemmas that patients and clinicians face and that we don't necessarily have good evidence for. This was what we called for, and there were many questions, hundreds of questions submitted when PCORI was established. We're continuing to figure out how to prioritize across those areas, and then put the evidence into a format that's usable. Something like this would be really great for us and for our patients, so that you could say, well, for all of these treatments, what are the factors, what are the side effects that I should think about? What's the cost that's there? What are the um, other issues? How effective is this individual drug for my condition? And we want to be able to lay this out in a way that makes sense. We um, have been asked to do this in a way that is peer-reviewed, but also published outside of the medical journal so that people really know where we're going. We've been asked to contribute to this conversation about value and quality in a way that uses an independent, non-governmental viewpoint of research funding and a research conversation. We're not doing cost-effectiveness research, but certainly many people have said, when you have the evidence, then I can apply what I know about cost, and we know it changes very quickly, um, and, and make a decision across treatment options. So this is where we're going. But we also know that there are many gaps in evidence. If you look at clinical practice guidelines, very few uh, of the individual recommendations are at level A evidence. We just don't have enough trials. So how do we get there? And I think part of it is partnering with funding organizations like us and then having PCORI influence other funders so that we do have higher levels of evidence guiding current quality standards today. We also know that if we have more evidence, We'll look at maps like this across geography, across populations, and we'll be able to have a conversation about reducing those variations and figuring out how we've worked together to overcome some of the gaps that are currently existing in our healthcare system. We know some of it is navigation, some of it is access, but some of it is just having good information to make um, better decisions over time. So we think about these multiple levels of interventions, and we hope that people will come with questions and comparisons about interventions at all of these levels, and then compare them to figure out how to best navigate, how best to overcome health disparities. They may be things that are at the community level, or at the policy level, or within the health systems, but these are some of the levels that we know are really important, and some of them are embedded into our improving healthcare systems portfolio and our addressing disparities portfolio. I think just as an example, this is another framework for thinking about how engagement provides an opportunity to provide feedback. So you take into account where the patients are, where the populations are, where the research questions are, and go through, develop an intervention that's appropriate, that comes with input from multiple stakeholders. You figure out what the outcomes are, and then you cycle back and you figure out where we're going and how we continue to improve. It's also thinking about this type of framework where you're thinking about interventions at the implementation level. You're not just talking about um, implementing a program that worked in Kaiser, not necessarily, but we want to think about where it was, where it started, and how you tailor it, how you make it um, more effective, and then how you maintain and create a, a pathway for continuous improvement. So this is just one example of a theme that's emerged in our addressing disparities portfolio. Many questions have come into us about how to best organize healthcare systems to overcome health disparities in, in numerous conditions. We have thought about um, why this is, we're not really sure, but a lot of people with an engagement perspective has submitted 
questions and research applications about community health workers. We know community health workers are patient navigators. There are many names um, and different versions of this across the country, but they may be able to help overcome some of the disparities that we see in our healthcare systems by providing a pathway to better navigate. And they also provide this natural link between healthcare systems and the community. It may be that we can start to think about value-based pay payment models. Um, but we don't have a lot of evidence about the effectiveness. Certainly, most health systems have not yet invested in ways to provide community health workers to all patients. Maybe it's on a limited basis, just uh, high utilizers or um, uh, other high, high, highly vulnerable populations. But interestingly, about 40% of the projects in our portfolio have some component of a community health worker. We didn't ask for it, we weren't funding this separately, but it has come to PCORI, and I think it's just one example of the type of work that we're gonna need to do to improve the evidence and then put it into practice. And so we are moving forward with that path. I think we'll have many stories to tell at the end of PCORI's um, time and whenever that is, um, but certainly we hope to work with policymakers to make sure that that evidence is moving forward and we'll see what happens next with PCORI. But thank you so much for this opportunity to share uh, a little bit about PCORI with you.